Hello, this is Kent Kersey. I'm the professor of this class. In this video, I want to set the general context for our class this semester. You know, when I started teaching worldview classes, I tried to find an authoritative definition for worldview. And I was actually kind of surprised to learn that there are a bunch of different definitions out there, and a lot of those definitions weren't like each other. And not only were the definitions different, but a lot of the different authors of worldview really didn't even agree about what the basic idea of worldview was. And as I read all of these books, I decided to find a definition that summarized the best part of all of these ideas. And so in this video, I want to do three basic things. First of all, we'll learn about the technical definition of worldview. Secondly, I'm going to give you the definition that we are going to be using for the rest of this semester. And thirdly, um, I want to explain how we should understand just the basic general idea of what a worldview is. So let's start with the word itself. Our word, worldview, is a translation of the German word Weltanschauung. Weltanschauung. This word was basically invented by a philosopher named Immanuel Kant in 1790. And he was essentially trying to explain a really complicated philosophical idea, and he just made up the word. Now, after Kant invented that word, Weltanschauung, other philosophers and deep thinkers adopted it. And over the years... It was used in a lot of different ways, and it ended up meaning a lot of different things. Okay, so how are we going to define worldview in our class? So to give some background, I found it sort of amusing that the most common definition that you can find of worldview, especially in Christian books, is from James Sire. And here's his definition. A worldview is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story, or a set of presuppositions, assumptions which may be true, partially true, or entirely false, which we hold consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently about the basic constitution of reality, and that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. So that's James Sire. So that simple definition has 64 words and about a million qualifications. In fact, in my first class, I was going to use that as our class definition, and students would memorize it. And then I realized that there was actually no way that I could memorize that long definition either, so we didn't use it. So after looking at as many definitions as I could find and trying to boil down what they were getting at, I came up with a definition that I think is a lot simpler. So here it is. Worldviews are ways of explicit, implicit, belonging, believing, and becoming. So this definition has four basic components to it. First of all, explicit, implicit deals with the fact that people don't adopt worldviews because they've thought about them. In fact, you have your worldview because of where you were raised, where you're born, where you went to school, who your parents are, which church you go to, the language you speak. In other words, your worldview is yours because of all of the background. It's implicit. But hopefully our worldviews become explicit too. By that, I mean that we need to understand our taken-for-granted programming so that we can keep the good and get rid of the bad. And hopefully this is what will happen in our class this semester together. But understanding your worldview isn't as easy as it sounds. The word belonging refers to the idea that your worldview is a result of the groups that you belong to. If you think about it, you actually belong to a lot of different groups. Family, church, your country, your city, your school, your classes, sports teams, all kinds of things. And all of these groups influence the way that you see the world around you. The word believing refers to the idea of your psychological and philosophical makeup. For example, 
psychologically, introverts and extroverts see the world very differently. As an extrovert or an introvert myself, I see things like fellowship time as, at church as, as torture, whereas my wife, who's an extrovert, she sees it as a great thing. Now, in terms of philosophy, we'll see that we all have different ways of answering questions like what is real, what is true, and what is good. One of the things that I really love about this class is that we get to ask questions that actually might seem like a waste of time at the beginning, but in reality, they help us to understand why so many people see the world in totally dissimilar ways. And the word becoming refers to the spiritual dimension of our worldview that is informed by the type of people that we are turning into. Now, why is it that some people never seem to be happy with the things that they have and others are fully content with owning practically nothing? Well, it's because somewhere in their programming, they've adopted varying ways of defining the good life that they are seeking. So the rest of the semester, our class will be examining these different parts of worldview. So now that we've seen the definition, I want to give an explanation of what worldview means in a very basic way. You might have seen a definition of worldview that sounds something like this. In the simplest terms, a worldview may be defined as how one sees life and the world at large. In this manner, it can be compared to a pair of glasses, and that's by Kenneth Samples in his book Reasons to Believe. In other words, we've all heard that a worldview is something that filters the world and changes it in some way. You know, sunglasses will darken the world. A, a bad prescription of your glasses will distort the image. The problem with this idea is that it implies that a worldview can easily be identified and changed. In reality, the idea of worldview is more like a computer program than a pair of glasses. Think about, for example, like a camera for a minute. Specifically, think about a camera that can use different filters or different lenses. There's something out there, like a tree, for example, and a telephoto lens will make the tree look close and a wide angle lens will make it look like it's way out in the distance. So some people would say that a worldview is like a lens, you know, change the lens and you change what you see. But in reality, a worldview is more like the program inside of that little computer that lives inside of the camera. That computer has been programmed to receive information, store that information somehow, and then transfer it somewhere like your laptop, for example. And if you know about computers, you know that computers speak a different language than we do. Computers, in fact, use a language that is binary. And in reality, computers don't think in words. They think in ones and zeros. And if you were to look at how the computer sees the tree, you would only see a long series of ones and zeros. The camera's worldview is made up of ones and zeros. Changing the lens only changes the order of the ones and the zeros. In the same way, your worldview has been programmed to see the tree differently than the camera. In fact, people don't see the tree in the same way. For example, a logger might see the tree as something to chop down in order to make money. A Greenpeace activist will see the tree as a living thing that needs protection. So the first basic thing to realize is that worldviews aren't external to us. They live deeply inside our social, psychological, and spiritual programming. I also want to give you a phrase to help us understand worldviews a little bit better. Here it is. The only thing you can take for granted is that you can't take anything for granted. This phrase, taken for granted, is really at the core of worldview. What would happen if you lived your whole life in the tropics? You would take it for granted that weather is always warm. You wouldn't even really have a concept of cold weather. What if you lived in a society of polygamists? You would take it for granted that men usually have more than one wife. 
If you were raised in a Muslim family in an Islamic country, you would take it for granted that worshiping Allah, according to the Quran, is really the only way to live life. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at some historical background and see that probably about 500 years ago, Europeans would have taken it for granted that Christianity was true, or they would have at least taken it for granted that there was a very strong supernatural presence all around them. When we fast forward to today, we see that our world has so many competing interpretations of the world, it's nearly impossible to take anything for granted. If, you were, if you're a Christian, you're surrounded by people who believe drastically different things than you do. And you'll always be challenged to question whether or not your beliefs are actually true. We can't just take our faith for granted since it's always being challenged by somebody. So when we think of worldview in today's world, we need to realize that we have to find ways of examining our programming without becoming overly cynical or skeptical. This is one of the reasons faith is so hard. We don't want to be naive about reality, but we also need to commit to something that might be impossible to fully understand. So worldview thinking requires us to actually become a bit vulnerable. I want you to check out this quote from John Stuart Mill. Mill says, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good and no one may have been able to refute them. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Also, here's a good quote from Aristotle. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. These ideas uncover a way of thinking that we have to use when we study worldview today. It's not enough to just accept things that are taken for granted. We need to understand what we believe and why we believe it. So this semester, we will set out to think about thinking. And like many who have gone on this journey before us, I am very confident that God's ways will actually become clearer and more attractive. So now that the lecture is done, there's a link to a quiz underneath, and the rest of the activities for this week will help us just explore what a worldview is and will hopefully help us also to get to know each other. So I look forward to uh, interacting with you guys and learning with you for the rest of the semester. Bye.